What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's your number one gamer ghoul broadcast. Take two. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's your number one gamer ghoul broadcasting dead from the chair I found in a dumpster two years ago. Oh yeah, the vinyl shedding off it like some kind of a th thing that would do something similar. B are you ready for a brand new video? No. That's okay. I understand. Here's the Fallout 2 is a post-apocalyptic CRPG developed by Black Isle Studios and published by Interplay for PC in 1998. A mere two months after the first game's release, Daddy Fallout Tim Kane would announce that work had begun on a sequel in tandem with a patch for the original. Following the near-universal acclaim and success of Fallout, as well as Baldur's Gate, which they published, Interplay was on a bit of a hot streak, one that they needed as they were quickly racking up debt and approaching bankruptcy. The company kept growing and expanding as a means to cover the open wound at the center of it, swelling from a team of 42 to over 600. They had also splintered their in-house dev teams into different divisions, with Black Isle focusing on RPGs. Though the team who worked on Fallout felt they had something special and lasting on their hands, there were initially very few at Interplay that saw promise in the admittedly niche and oddball project. Of course, after it launched and sold well, it magically generated a lot of interest and support from Interplay, who wanted to get moving on a sequel as soon as possible. They needed hits, and they needed them fast. Thus began an unpleasant, albeit brief, production. While Fallout 1 was in the works for four years, its sequel was completed in about 11 months. All the while, Interplay's sudden, desperate interest in the franchise acted as a blessing and a curse leaning more towards the latter. There were plenty of gems in the Interplay library, but Black Isle was the only one that consistently turned a profit. The RPGs were going to be their meal ticket. This time around, they had a sizable budget, but also input from the marketing team and investors like Universal, who wanted the studio to become the next EA, which mostly served to frustrate Black Isle as they struggled to force lightning back into the bottle for a game they hadn't even planned to make. Tim Kaine would later say about this period, We went from being the project no one cared about, and no one gave us any direction, to suddenly being in the spotlight. It wasn't fun. It went from being something that was a labor of love, to something that became labor. Fallout 1 was put under a similar kind of scrutiny when they had initially partnered with Steven Jackson to use the D&D rule set, and he did not like the game's violence, and had a weird problem with Vault Boy, despite having like hundreds of art assets involving this mascot character, Jackson just wanted this dude gone or he walked. And, well, Vault Boy's still around. In that circumstance, stakes were lower, and they didn't have to compromise their vision for a lot of things, like choosing to open the game with a rather brutal public execution. This time around, the team seemed to be fighting for things as trivial as box art, to things as important as the inclusion of a tutorial level. This came to a head a few months into production, when Tim Kaine could no longer deal with the influence from marketing and sales and decided to leave Interplay. His exit spurred artists Jason D. Anderson and Leonard Boyard to also quit, refusing to work on a Fallout sequel without Kane. And those three would go on to form Troika Games. Fortunately for Interplay, whose management scarcely noticed a core part of the Fallout team departing, Fallout 2 was built largely on the bones of the original, and much of the preliminary work was done. Many of the team who remained to finish the game remarked on the strange energy the development would take on, now that the dudes that made the game were doing a sequel for left. On top of already having to make a sequel to a successful game in a matter of months, it needed to sell better, otherwise the lights would go out, and it needed to be 50% bigger. To add some levity to the long periods of crunch, level designers were encouraged to add humorous, distracting Attractions and pop culture references into the wasteland, which when I read that back sounds like take a break from working with more work, but I guess they figured this was some kind of zany consolation. There is pride and affection for the game amongst its creators, but it's clear that there is a shadow over the experience due to the stressful work schedule, studio pressure, and void left by its missing director. There was a Tim here, and it's gone now. Undoubtedly, Fallout 2... <sighs> okay. Uh, yeah, you're on the air. Oh, good. I'm so glad to be back. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Oh, God. It was so weird. Hey, since I got you on the horn, uh, how do you feel about the Fallout series? It's brilliant. I've experienced some of the worst things it has to dish out and some of the best. That's fair. Hey, why do you think people still play Fallout 76? Uh, I mean, to me, it looks like uh, one of them, uh, one of them bad games. 
But, you know, that's just me. It is overwhelmingly terrible. Yeah. And they don't know how to tell people. And there's no bottom. I mean, it's quicksand and people don't know where to, they don't know where to turn and Mm -hmm. all kinds of wild stuff. A lot of people are taking it to be true. Somehow, we have to end the whole process of secrecy. You know, Harry Truman said... <laughs> I gotta tell you, buddy, that's the same thing uh, I was thinking. All right, I'll talk to you, you later. Well. Undoubtedly, did I, did I start a sentence with undoubtedly already? Let me just control F here. Undoubtedly. I did not. Undoubtedly, Fallout 2 was a critical and commercial success. And to some degree, that passion and following is still there. You're still likely to see it listed as one of the greatest RPGs of all time and one of the greatest games of all time. You're likely to still see that fickle divide in fandom between the first two games and the direction other developers would take the franchise. And beyond that, the divide between which of these two games is the stronger one. Which one better embodies the vision of Fallout? These are the real questions. This is how I determine whether or not I view you as a sensible use of human life. That's right, I'm one of those guys now. You ever just say a joke and it like exhausts you? On the likely chance you kind of skipped the original Fallout, as well as my video about it, or any other media concerning it, yeah, that game's just too old and it's janky, and it doesn't have, uh, Ray Mono tracing. <coughs> which is a breathtaking technique of simulating the way Ray Romano interacts with environments and objects. I will summarize, I guess, what this game is continuing. Also, uh, spoilers for that game, but, but also like, it's a sequel, what do you want me to do? Eh? Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. No, I don't want to do that. The world of Fallout takes place in an alternate history timeline that breaks from the timeline we know around the early 1960s, in which the world is devastated by nuclear war, killing or mutating anyone who wasn't hidden safely in a series of self-sustaining underground vaults. It's a world that depicts a failed vision of the future, the one dreamt up in 1950s science fiction. Optimistic about the lifestyle and gifts that science would grant us, only to have it destroy nearly everything. This charming retrofuturism clashes in a darkly comedic way with just how bleak and unforgiving post-war life is. In the first Fallout, I mean, you can skip to this time if you've already heard this. You know what, never mind. I need those minutes watched, baby. <laughs> Almost a century after the war, a vault dweller from Vault 13 is sent out into the wasteland in order to find a vital piece of tech that will save his people from their impending demise, a water chip. And while searching for a replacement water chip, the player leaves a trail of heroic deeds, canonically, that either enriched or just changed the course of the different lives and communities struggling to survive in the wasteland. Once a water chip is located, the vault dweller Weller realizes there is a much more daunting threat in the growing number of super mutants found in close proximity to Vault 13. The result of humans coming into contact with a virus called FEV, Forced Evolutionary Virus. That is a byproduct of a failed pre-war super soldier program. More and more of these mutants are showing up, and they're big, green and dumb, but also violent and seemingly organized. The Vault Dweller works with the Brotherhood of Steel, a technologically advanced spiritual remnant of the US military, to discover that a mysterious cult prevalent in the wasteland called Children of the Cathedral are actually working to enact the transhumanist goals of their leader, simply named Master, an unpleasant looking cybernetic amalgamation of flesh and machine that wants to replace humanity with the genetically super superior super mutants. In the end, the master is defeated and the source of the virus is destroyed. Triumphant, the vault dweller returns to Vault 13 only to be exiled from his home due to the vault overseer's worry that the experience had changed them, made them a danger to others, or worse, their heroic adventures would inspire others to leave. He starts talking to me like I'm some kind of irredeemable monster or something. <laughs> Crawl. Fallout 2 takes place a good 80 years after the events of Fallout. Between games, a makeshift government begins spreading across the South called the New California Republic, or NCR. After the super mutant invasion was thwarted, the Brotherhood of Steel had largely disappeared back into their bunkers. That is, until a new threat emerges in the mysterious Enclave, a bloodthirsty and even more technologically advanced group. All throughout the wasteland, there are these disconnected groups without a real identity. They're colloquially called 
called tribes, just loose-knit societies of people that have gathered to scrape together a life without any of the aid or sophistication of the larger cities and camps. Which by the way, at this point, most of the major cities are suffering from a drug epidemic thanks to the invention of a hallucinogenic amphetamine called Jet. A lot of Jet is supplied from Redding, which is not unlike the actual city of Redding in California, where I'm positive you could buy all the Jet you want. This game starts out in a tribal community called Arroyo, a small settlement started by the first game's protagonist, some other former members of Vault 13, as well as various wanderers picked up on the way. We see that the village still holds the Vault Dweller as this mythical savior figure, and in the midst of an unending drought, they initiate the Vault Dweller's grandchild as the chosen one, fit to don the Vault Dweller's Vault Suit and Pip-Boy in order to follow in their grandparents' footsteps by saving a bunch of dummies with a magical clean water dispenser. I think you get two of those, uh, but I sure hope that doesn't wind up being a plot point in future installments. That, that would be, that'd be a dumb dumb move. Water and crops. What a boring MacGuffin. Who would do that more than one? Free clean water for everyone. This time around, the crucial piece of tech is called a Gek, or Garden of Eden Creation Kit a device meant to be used shortly after the bombs dropped in order to establish new settlements on the surface. Every vault was equipped with one of these, so the village elder deduces that Vault 13 is likely to have one, as they never made an effort to leave the safety of their vault. They have no idea where it is though, and most settlements in the area are only familiar with it from tales of the Vault Dweller and assume it never existed. Like the first one, you are then released into an open world to go do that thing and get distracted by other things that are more interesting than that. I'll take a break here so you can decide if you would uh, not like to hear Fallout 2 spoilers. Feel free to skip to this time if you don't want to hear a vague summary of things that happened in this game that is over 20 years old. Though there is an interesting phenomenon that occurs with this game every time I play it, which is sort of good but also an indication of something bad. But there's a twist that happens like two thirds into the game and I always forget that it happens. So I've somehow managed to experience that twist for the first time several times over. Very cool, but if I found much of the plot to be more memorable, I feel like I that wouldn't uh, be happening. I don't know. Is that even like a useful metric memory? I have a terrible memory. I forgot what I do during this strange intermediary segment. Do I take calls? Hello, caller. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? Yeah, hi, I'm Egg. So, I didn't like, that was a man, the man's name was Egg. I, I didn't like that. For a long stretch, you're just kind of following the legend of Vault 13. On the assumption that any old vault will probably have a geck, the chosen one heads to Vault 15. Oop, hang on. <laughs> you goddamn fucker. Which is not as secret but it has been claimed by a group of bandits. Fighting through them reveals that the vault no longer has a geck, but it does have a working computer with a vault directory of sorts that reveals the location of Vault 13. Strangely enough, Vault 13 is mostly in working order, but most of its inhabitants have been replaced by talking death claws, which is odd, but you know, the times they are uh, becoming quite different. It's that, see, it's that easy. That's how they did it. That's how they wrote Fallout 2. There are already towns composed of super mutant defectors. And ghouls, even. The line between human and mutant is increasingly gray. Sure, there are still communities that would shoot either on sight, but some of the more tolerant settlements have integrated them into their community. Plus, it's just funny thinking about death claws trying to do mundane, menial tasks like change a coffee filter or push a tiny pair of glasses up the bridge of their nose. Amusingly, this is exactly what they need help with in exchange for a geck. And I should mention that there are a lot of different ways to play this game. And this is not the only way you can acquire the geck. You can also just take their geck without helping them, or find it somewhere else. The Deathclaw need help repairing the voice activation function of the vault's computers because they can't type on the keyboards with their big stabby paws. They're pointy beans! Uh, so you grab the geck and you head on back to Arroyo to save your everyone's dead. They're all dead. They died. And it- Shit. I dropped my phone into a box of crackers. You killed them. You're a murderer. You're a bad person. It's unforgivable. There's no forgiveness for that sort of thing. I know that. Before his death, the village healer is able to intimate that the Enclave was responsible 
and that many of their people had not been killed but captured and flown away in vertebrates. The Brotherhood of Steel have been present during your travels, clearly aware of your activity, but not interfering or offering anything other than a cryptic hint. Once the people of Arroyo are taken, and later the inhabitants of Vault 13, the Brotherhood decides to help the Chosen One, being out of their depth for the first time in a long while. They have deduced that the Enclave's main headquarters are on an offshore oil rig near San Francisco, and that they are composed of what remains of the pre-war US government. Concurrently, we see glimpses of our main antagonist committing various acts of violence. He looks to be a massive power armor clad uh, uh, fucker. He can take down Brotherhood of Steel soldiers like nothing. He can tear apart Deathclaw with his bare hands. It's concerning. In contrast to Fallout, where you don't see the bad guy until the end where he lays out his plan. Fallout 2 makes an earnest attempt at building tension with this impending threat. The only problem being that the master is going to stay with you, and this guy is kind of forgettable. He is man in suit man. The chosen one manages to fix up an old oil tanker and invade, or sneak into, the Enclave stronghold, where a lot is revealed. The Enclave were looking for the military base that held the FEV experiments, the one we blew up in the first game. They excavated it and managed to reverse engineer the virus and alter it into an airborne chemical weapon. And the current president, who is still alive, wants to use this simple modification to distribute this virus uh, to all mutated creatures and destroy them. Again, another plot point that would be very silly if they did ever again. With a simple modification, it can be used to distribute agents that destroy mutated creatures. That would only affect those with a mutated DNA, which is most of the people on the planet, with the exception of these guys and, weirdly enough, the original inhabitants of Vault 13. See, when Vault Tech started putting people in vaults, you'd think they'd be used to shelter the best and brightest of the US, or at least most wealthy and powerful, but really, they were a series of social and psychological experiments for various research projects, and let's be honest, pranks. With the exception of Vault 13, the control group, the one vault that was meant to be used for its intended purpose and sustain life for at least 200 years. It was merely a random happenstance that its water chip malfunctioned and required anyone to leave it. To the Enclave, this made them prime subjects to test out their modified FEV virus on. They decided to throw in the people of Arroyo as well, seeing as though some of the founders were former Vault 13 dwellers. So they figure they'd release this virus, killing off anyone with radioactive DNA in some flimsy, big, stupid plan to make America tremendous once more. All the nice ghouls, super mutants, death claws, and even tribals, anyone with a shred of glowing, scary DNA is gonna explode. Your dad, pa! Your friend's dad, pa! All the dads. Okay. Big Suit Boy is revealed to be a guy named Frank Horrigan, who was by all accounts, okay, a dumb asshole, propelled through the ranks of the Secret Service solely by his undying loyalty to the Enclave. After committing every atrocity there is, he came into contact with FEV, making him even stronger and even dumber. So they once again saw this as an opportunity to tinker with life and kept injecting him with different strains of FEV until he was a huge fucking idiot. The Chosen One concocts a plan to free the prisoners, but is confronted by Horrigan on the way out, making his final act of dumb moron idiocy, setting the oil rig to self-destruct, choosing to destroy all that remains of pre-war government uh, because he's pissed that you've bested him. That'll show him. Is that it? We're gonna do that anyway. Um, I'm trying to include as many pop culture references as I can, just as a meta joke, but I may get tired of that halfway through so don't come don't at me anyway snack breaks over the chosen one and the people of arroyo escape on the oil tanker while the president the enclave and the final remnants of pre-war america are consumed by a mushroom cloud of fiery death i'm sorry i didn't mean to sound so uh chipper while saying that. Like the end of Fallout 1, we are treated to a slideshow revealing the fate of all the communities we've crossed paths with, and some we might not have, so they're probably dead. You banished yet another species of the realms of extinction, proving once again that genocide is a viable solution 
to any problem. Whoa, 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 I, I, don't, I don't think that's quite what I proved, all right? Pretty sure I tried to save them and a bug prevented me from doing so. Let's not go around saying that for me. Okay, I'm done spoiling the game. Come back now. Could have used your company during that segment. Probably fucked up and missed a whole lot of good details, but whatever. Okay, I just want to say, Firstly, I love Fallout 2. Fallout 1 and 2 are comfort games. There is a cozy, replayable quality to them. Fallout's always there for me, certainly more than the friends and family I've pushed away. I love the additions to the lore that this game makes to the... Fallout... What the fuck is that? I love the additions to the lore that this game makes to the Fallout world. People watch this? I love the additions to the Fallout lore. It both honors and expands it, and in an agreeable fashion, I would say. Uh, the important thing to me that Fallout 2 retains is the focus on smaller stories in a big world. You got a ton of little stories, and all with multiple solutions and outcomes. There is a main plot that is big and weighty, the implications of it are massive and concern the fate of the planet to some extent, but that's just a foundation for a bunch of smaller stories to be told, almost like a road movie. Movie. It's like Pee-wee's Big Adventure, but with more visual gags. I would say, and this is where I can no longer put off my uh, incorrect opinion, I'd, I'd say it's less successful at doing this than the original Fallout. I think a big part of my reasoning for this opinion is that while Fallout 2 is a substantially larger and lengthier game, its substance is stretched kind of thin. So I can still find new things that I missed in previous playthroughs, but I have much clearer memories of the different areas and characters in Fallout 1. There is a tightness or a conciseness to it it's smaller. It's smaller, but it's using what it has more intelligently. Um, sex sex joke. joke. You can feel the concentration of ideas in Fallout 1. You can feel the four years behind it. There is a lot of content in its sequel, but it can often feel really disjointed and seemingly random. Just removed from a cohesive world. There are one or two areas that seem like complete ideas, that are charming and memorable, but a lot of them feel like just an area where things happen. Could be a sentient plant that wants to move to richer soil, could be a ghost that needs to find her missing locket, or a rad scorpion that plays chess. And while these may be interesting or fun quests, they just kind of happen in this detached fashion. And I don't always feel that, but I feel it a lot especially because the game indulges so much in diversions. And I don't mean like side quests or even quests that feel inconsequential, but like literally stopping you to look at something that is just a goof or a recreation of a scene from a movie. Fallout 1 was no stranger to these silly pop culture non sequiturs, but I remember them as Easter eggs, as just a cool thing you could stumble on. But for Fallout 2, this is like most of what stuck with me. When I think of Fallout 2, I think of being stopped to watch a Monty Python sketch. Who approaches the bridge of death must answer me these questions three. Uh, the other side he sees. It also doesn't help that the intention was to make a Fallout game with more Fallout. If there was a dial of Falloutness, they turned it from five to all the way until the knob broke off. Please refrain from testing the knob. So the way that the original played with a bleak, depressive atmosphere and dark humor is pushed to extremity on either end, creating this intense dissonance for me. It creates a tone that is all over the map. The world has become noticeably more adult. There are plot lines involving slave trade, prostitution, the still active adult film industry, crime syndicates, the murder of children. The game opens with a waving family being brutally gunned down, but all of that is counteracted by a dump truck of zany jokes and once topical references. Anything from Clerks to Jerry Maguire to the Monica Lewinsky scandal to The Simpsons, which I actually give a pass to. All games should reference The Simpsons. Those same characters, by the way, that gunned down that family later on are depicted murdering an ally of yours. And it's played for laughs. It has a confusing Looney Tunes energy to it. It's not something that ruins the experience. In fact, the over-the-top nature of it all is endearing in its own way, but I don't feel like it surpasses Fallout 1 in any regard. What I could say is a clear improvement over the first, at least as far as plot is concerned, are your companion characters. They are markedly more unique and developed. They even have character portraits and their own side stories to explore. You have an eclectic mix of companions to choose from, and even ones that would seem absurd to befriend in the first game, like a ghoul or a super mutant or a tribal dude that talks to the bone pierced through his nose. They're still unreliable morons from a gameplay perspective, but hey, at least I know 
just who I'm disappointed in this time around. The Poetry of the main character's objective aside, much of the initial world building in this game is really good. I don't know how much of this was established before the staff exodus, but the way Fallout 2 builds off the first game is often really clever and sweet. I love that we see how the Vault Dweller is revered and mythologized in these little interactions, like a ghoul that bumped into them during the Necropolis area of the first game and wishes he had the guts to go talk to them and offer his help. It's no doubt in part due to the two games' proximity to one another, but it's not often a game's sequel feels like a natural continuation of the previous game, like you've just stepped right back into the same world. And you get glimpses of that. It's a similar hit. It's just funnier now, and confuses you a bit, especially by opening on this weird Indiana Jones tutorial level. Don't see how that fits into the theme, but it's, it's fine. A lot of the humor comes from the fact that we're playing as a fish out of water, a character that has been raised in this deeply spiritual and archaic society, and everyone immediately reads that. So when they go around saying, oh yeah, that, that vault dweller was my grandfather, and I'm the chosen one, on a mission to find the holy geck. They get lots of side eyes. I think that's when the game's sense of humor is landing and feels natural. Like it just makes sense that everyone would be horrendously shitty to this person that is just learning all these things that are alien to them. When the jokes are tied to the situation and bleakness of the world, it's great. One of my favorite parts is when you sneak into an enclave base to steal some plans and you keep getting chewed out by a sergeant after you show up without the power armor that everyone else has. Double time on over the armory and get your issue! And report back to me! Nishmash! It's a shame that it often feels like there are two sides of this game that are clashing with one another. One side is fantastic, and the other side is different. Not bad, but ill-fitting. I focus on these criticisms only to highlight my appreciation for the first game. It's still, uh, one of the best, uh, better games ever, uh, out there. I don't know why I couldn't commit to that compliment. We don't, we don't have to go into it. Fallout 2 is a great game with a great world and a good story. It's good, but it's got some identity issues. I think some part of me was just afraid that I was speaking ill of a great game at such length and I just needed to walk some of it back. Oh, well now I have to talk about gameplay, which, which isn't gonna be much better. Much like the story, the gameplay of Fallout 2 aims to be like Fallout 1 but more. It's the same engine and same programming but with several small tweaks to what was already there, meant to refine the experience and address additions that fans of the first had expressed interest in. Not to repeat too much of what you may already know, but this is an isometric open world game with turn-based combat, using action points that you spend to perform, movements and attacks on a hexagonal grid. You travel between hub areas completing quests and gaining XP to level up your characters, as well as collecting items and equipment, or money which can buy many items. Explain how. Money can be exchanged for goods and services. Um, is it fun if it just keeps uh, happening out of nowhere? I don't know. I think it is actually. Yeah, never mind. This, this is the best game ever made. Yeah. Fallout 2 differs slightly in regard to quests because it's more likely that a quest line will bounce you back and forth between settlements. A move they made, I'm guessing, thanks to the added freedom that comes without any anxiety-inducing death clock on the main quest. There is a time limit of 13 years, but it's pretty unlikely you'd hit that. Time does move pretty fast, like it takes you weeks to heal your party, or several days to move from one place to another, but it's not nearly enough to hit that cap anytime soon. So I guess it is there. Is that what I'm saying? I'm gonna rewrite that and say like, oh, th actually there is one. It's just very forgiving. The passage of time can be further combated with one of the more enjoyable additions, a nuclear powered car, which shaves your travel time in half and acts like a moving storage unit. The only catch being you have to refuel it with power cells, the item that energy weapons consume. But if you're like me and rarely touch energy weapons, you're gonna be swimming in fuel. Uh, just like my high school. Oh, uh, how many years has it been? Never mind. Actually, the card does come with another catch that is easy to forget about, but just, uh, just keep an eye on it, okay? Just, uh, just make sure you know where it is. There is a quest where it gets stolen and you gotta get it back, and I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying. Keep an eye on it. Most of the items, weapons, and enemies, and general assets from the first game make a reappearance, but a great deal of new things are thrown into the mix. So you got bandits and rad scorpions, but you also got big ol' geckos and aliens, which are actually not aliens, but it's obvious why they're called that, because they look like aliens from the movie Alien. 
You get new skills and perks, and an effort is made to have all your skills come into play at some point in gameplay, unlike the first where you could largely ignore many of them. The reputation function from the first game is split into karma and reputation, with the former reflecting the morality of your choices and the latter reflecting a community's opinion of you. You're given several more options for companions, but more important options for controlling your companions. This time around, you can fine-tune their strategies, their distance from you, their temperament. They can level up and learn new things. It's a noteworthy improvement. Um, it's just, it's just that companions are always real dumb. They're gonna die a lot, probably. Like, um, no matter what you do for them. Okay, I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, Marcus, but this doesn't seem like a good idea. Marcus. All right, I'm gonna change you to start with ranged combat and only switch to melee if they get close. You got a rocket launcher and a minigun, it's gonna be great. No, 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 Mar Marcus, Marcus! Marcus! Tell them not to immediately run into a circle of enemies and they'll stand behind you and shoot through you to get to them. They are a hassle to keep alive, to the point that when they do prove to be helpful or intelligently use the instructions you give them, it's kind of impressive. It feels like a win all on its own. Wham! <laughs> You're up, Marcus, buddy. Make these dorks wish they never- Marcus! The average fight still feels satisfying, especially when you score a critical hit using VATS, the system of calling shots to particular areas of an enemy. <laughs> well, that's over. What an idiot. Guess I'll just uh, exit combat. Gameplay and quality of life is technically better in a lot of ways, but like other elements, they tend to overdo it. Random encounters can be pretty relentless, especially with a lower level character. Fallout 1 felt like you'd get into small fights that were punctuated by these bigger, almost set piece kind of fights, and there was a natural progression there. In Fallout 2, I feel like they knew that fans liked these bigger fights and made all the fights like that, and without the same pacing or significance, it can make combat feel a little tiresome, a little empty. You don't quite know why you're doing something uh, so significant. Might be it's not significant. And even though a lot of it was alleviated with unofficial patches, it also shipped with a considerable amount of broken quest lines and bugs. Playing it unpatched on a modern machine, you'll encounter numerous crashes and preposterous frame rate drops when there, there are too many NPCs on screen. That will not stop until you restart your game. There are tons of ways to improve the game now and amend all these oversights from the initial version, but it's further testament to how needlessly Interplay pushed Black Isle. I mean, I guess there was a need because uh, they needed them to uh, live, but it makes you wonder what Fallout 2 could have been had they first trusted the only division that had routinely been a net gain, and secondly, set a believable human deadline because you probably won't make a masterpiece in a few months with a bunch of dudes that didn't even want to make the darn thing. Thing. And when there is that transference from the people that made a standalone piece of art to others that are instructed to expand that, there's a disconnect. They're gonna take different lessons from the first game, especially when it's so driven by fan and marketing input. You can't trust gamers to know what makes a good game. They don't even know that games are political yet. I can't say too much about Fallout 2 visually that would be all that different from a review of Fallout 1. It stays pretty consistent with the theme of the first one. There are moments here and there where that feels a bit muddled with other things, but it's mostly on point. The art style is still incredibly charming and environments look detailed, almost too detailed sometimes, making it hard to find objects that are like two pixels by two pixels. I love it though. I could stare at games that look like this forever. I guess that's sort of my plan also. I never really thought about it like that. There are mods to make the game's textures HD and play the game in full 1080p, which is quite impressive, but I don't think I was meant to enjoy that. It's like a genuine eyesore. I can't even focus on playing the game because I'm just exhausted from seeing the fucking code. bed and believe whatever you want to believe. 
yeah, okay. Again, there are a handful of characters with animated portraits, cleverly created with digitized clay models. These are very fun and expressive. I think the returning character, Harold, is probably my favorite. <laughs> well, technically, it's a thingy. Uh, he's just a sweet weirdo of a ghoul, and apparently since the last game, he's developed a tree branch growing out of his head. So that's pretty funny. What's that doing there? What an absolute loon. Love this guy. Uh, ghouls don't really age because uh, they're sort of already dead. But this guy's this guy's living more than anyone. The voice casting is fantastic, though it doesn't carry as much star power as the previous game. They got some names to drop, though. Ron Perlman, of course, returns for the opening narration. But you also got Worf playing Marcus, Barkley playing Hakunin. He's no, no Brad Garrett, but uh, what can you do? And the president is played by... <laughs> oh boy. Composer Mark Morgan returns for the score, which is equally as uh, wonderful as the last one. Maybe even slightly more so, full of warm, desolate beds of ambience, hand percussion, distant voices, occasionally you'll catch a flute or a twangy guitar. <laughs> you bastard. It's very, very stuck out of time in that way. Each area has a track of its own that, like the first game, seems Almost as though it's a ghostly reflection of what that place was layered on top of what it's become. They've also continued the now tradition of opening with a sardonically optimistic vintage song, which works well, even if it is kind of the same bit twice. I, I don't know why I feel compelled to criticize everything. Maybe it's just because I'm on the internet and that's what you do. You publicly announce your shitty game takes, but I refuse to do that anymore. Hello, not doing any shitty takes today. How can I help you? Can you state for the record that Fallout, New Vegas, is the best game in the franchise? It would mean a lot to me if you could confirm this. I think it's... This game is utterly fucking broken. UI is bad, dialogue is bad, gameplay is bad. If you think you like this game, you're only remembering the Enclave. Everything else is god-awful. Also, it rivals the Bethesda games in terms of game-breaking bugs. This is a weird tactic I see a lot when looking at modern reviews of older games. This insistence that your memory is at fault. That I had such a bad time connecting with a game that the only explanation for others enjoying it is this shared delusion. Which in this case is odd because I don't fully understand what you're only remembering the Enclave means. Like are you referring to a specific part involving them? Uh, whatever the answer to that is, it's not what I find memorable about the game. It's the fun setting and gameplay, and the Austin Powers references. It's interesting to see where the Fallout series started, but other than that, it's not worth playing. This is, like, pure Fallout, right? These two games are the source. Everything after this is chemical runoff. It's, it's the good thing about Fallout Frankensteined into something else to varying degrees of quality. Worth playing? If you ask me, game didn't age well. Tried playing again, and I forgot how much of a little beta B1 titch you are in the game. You bend over and take it from everything in the game. You even miss 90% of all attacks. Hot trash. Was better when I played it forever ago. Not sure why. Firstly, please. Okay, a little decorum. It's, it's not that kind of show. Secondly, you gotta build for the character you want. You want it to be a shooty man, you build a shooty man. It functions like a tabletop game. It's a series of dice rolls, but by design. This was the intention. It's not something that didn't age well, it's just a type of gameplay it seems like you don't like. I don't know why it was better forever ago. Maybe you've suffered some kind of brain malady since then. Well, I bought this game expecting it to have good stuff. I'm a big Fallout fan, and I love the lore. It's just... This game has the worst combat of mankind. Pipe Rifle versus Mole Rat Pup equals Mole Rat Pup wins. Nerf Mole Rats, please. I don't want to answer all of these with get goodisms, but 
Gunplay is difficult at first. It is honestly kind of a strange move that they decided to discourage guns for the first hour or so of gameplay. And the first one you get is the pipe rifle, which isn't great. I'd suggest working to trade for another gun early on and focus your points on small arms. And, but also, you know it's not the worst gameplay of mankind. Come on. You know that. That's a silly thing to say. Have you played Fallout 3? You can't even kill kids in that one. What are you, what are you just going to show me a kid and not let me kill them? It's, it's borderline cruel is what it is. I tried to like this game. I even tried it off Steam after I asked for a refund. This game is just so boring though. My first playthrough, war never changes, go to the temple of trials or something, giant ant appeared, punch ant, you missed. Uh, try putting points in unarmed. That would increase the likelihood of you successfully punching something. You see, giant ant, you miss. You miss. Literally the entire time I was on the first mission. The fuck? Try putting points in melee. That would increase the likelihood of you successfully stabbing something. You fail to pick the lock on the container. You fail to pick the lock on the container. You definitely pick the lock on the container. You gain 25 experience. Try putting points in lock pick. That would increase the likelihood of you successfully picking a lock. Are you fucking kidding me? Miss, 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 miss. You died. Miss, 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 miss. You died. Repeat. Worst game I have ever seen in my life, especially considering the cult following. Dumbass fanboys coming to the rescue of a piece of garbage game. Just because they know how to abuse the game. Pathetic. Uh, you're pathetic. Because you're too much of a dummy to figure out the secrets to abusing the game. Your feeble mind can't comprehend this mature, consensual, alternative lifestyle we've entered into with Fallout 2. Enjoy your vanilla pudding, dork. Worst game ever. Don't waste money on it. It would be much better if it wasn't pixelated and needs to be more like Fallout New Vagus or Fallout 3. This game is the worst one in the Fallout series. I included this simply for your spelling of New Vagus. Uh, I was pretty silly. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, you are incorrect though. I really just don't see the appeal in this game. It's painfully slow paced and having to click everything with a mouse just makes it that much more painful. Oh, did all the clicking hurt your little fingies? Yeah? You gonna cry? You gonna piss? This game leaves a bad taste in my mouth, like crap taste. No tutorials, no objective, no nothing. Maybe if the graphics weren't for the N64, then the game might have still been crap actually, come to think of it. This is your master of recuse, signing off. Well, the first area is supposed to be an interwoven tutorial of sorts. I know it never comes out right and says that, but I think the developers had faith that the player would recognize what was happening. I'm not sure what you mean by no objective. There are quests, and when you agree to participate in one, they appear in your Pip-Boy. I'd also suggest you go see an eye doctor because you have stupid eyes that made you think this looks like this. It's not okay that you think that. Please do not get behind a wheel. Fallout 2 is a game that has no business being as enjoyable as it is. But strangely, it's a very enjoyable game, and even stranger, it outperformed its predecessor. Nobody save for the higher-ups at Interplay created Fallout with a franchise in mind. It was a singular lightning strike, followed by some dummy staring at the smoldering earth and saying, Hey, do that again, but bigger! And I don't know how, but that's what happened. To some extent, it certainly succeeded at being Fallout, but more and fast. I think I do understand why some prefer this one out of the two classic games. There is more content, it's more streamlined, it's more funny, and honestly I'm sure a big part of it is the lack of a time limit. I held on to that anxiety for a long time. If Fallout ever came up, my first thought would be, oh boy, that's the one with the time limit, right? Until, you know, I, I dug my fingers into my palms until they bled and I just said, frick it, it's gamer time. Uh, then I felt a hot wave of shame uh, for saying that out loud and waking up the, the person Whose, whose house I was in. It, it's a good, the game is good though. I, I understand picking the game that looks, sounds, and plays like the first one, but doesn't have that divisive mechanic looming over it. Like some kind of big egg. <laughs> I mean, clock. Fallout 1 is undoubtedly a labor of love. It's just a good idea with good execution that was meant to be a self-contained little world, a locked room that someone jimmied open. Fallout 2 is not without its charm. There is a certain undefinable magic to its improvisation. It takes chances while working to honor and build on the first game. There are long stretches where this works just fine, 
and it's a lot of fun. It's rife with places to explore and discover, and all sorts of zany characters to come across and help out, or brutally murder in spectacular fashion. It's, it's still amazing to make a person explode. I can't stress that enough. There is so much to do in this game. After all this time, I'm positive I've still missed out on a number of minor quests and random encounters, and there's also a not insignificant part of the game that isn't very fun. That feels kind of tiresome when it's skidded off the foundation and tried to fix what wasn't broken. There are these small tweaks to the formula made by people who didn't work on the first one and maybe didn't know why things were programmed the way they were or why some things were done in moderation. It's hard not to lead everything back to the game's production. It's easy to rag on this one, but I see both Fallout 1 and 2 as marvels all their own. They are infinitely replayable and in their own ugly way quite beautiful. From design to plot to music, there's a comfort and familiarity to them. I recommend them uh, with the understanding that people know Fallout for vastly different reasons now, and associate it with different things, and would largely write off a game that is over 20 years old and in a genre that very rarely gets mainstream attention. Give it a shot if it's on sale, and you got an open mind, and you don't have anything else to play, which you do, but then hey, uh, then you can say you tried it out, and maybe you'll like it, and you can be a an elitist prick about it. really good. That's the end of the video. Thank you for watching my video. I, I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're staying safe, especially the last person who left a very strange comment that me saying stay safe meant fuck you. Um, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean it for you. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Be sure to, you know, I don't want to tell you what to do. You can do whatever you want, but like, as an option, you could subscribe, potentially. You could like or uh, engage in the comments. Uh, you could also follow me on other things like Twitter or Discord. My Twitter is uh, at Grimebeard, uh, not Grimbeard because uh, some fucking guy took that already and uh, so I can't have it, but that's okay. Special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Resurrection, Game Master, Bayard Brown, This Deal Is Getting Worse All The Time, Nazim Kamalu Ray, News Time, Karen Mavel, Dark Raptor 86, Oisto, Alexander Sundin, Octo, Alexander Smith, Joseph Zanoni, Doss Days, Brandon Kostwick, Charles Marr, Pizza Shift, Daphne Pittendridge, Jacob Sewers, Ridley the Savior, Andre Perkins, Stuka Bliat, Matt Bastard, Fart Mother, Karen, Whip It Out, Turts, uh, Crimson Dark, Rui Bisomim, Gaudi McGork, Moonpix, Ava Nerve, Andre Kalganov, Sergei Vorontsov, P. Dizzle, Ophelia Fishwife, A Hanging Chad, Donut Stalker, Simon Murray, Brozoof Jones, Ishanji, Rose, Spooky, Mandalore Gaming, Astro Shepard, David Harpstrite, Dan Cullen, Dazed Clockwork, Edward Crawford, Brendan McFadden, Travis Houston, Hannes Jacoby, Big Honk, Tyler Robinson, Honey BB, Robert Scotland, Nunu, Persian Air, M, Nick Timmins, Tommy Steenrod, Dennis Dahlhausen, Day Yang, Jake Desi, Brody Gibson, Alistair Stewart, Niles D. McDonald, Marcus Chaney, Junk Food, Robert, Ombud, Commissar, Doxapine, Vlastan, Pekrosha, Arshis Nate, Spider, Leland Miliokis, Alas Ratgunk, Atlantean Goldfish, Sergey Vadovin, Rowdy Roddy Peeper, Major Millions, Tyler F., Mr. Bujangles, Ivo Zap, Alec Galler, Strahinka Redenkovich, Dan Richardson, Fred Grison, Lost via Domus, Megan Carmody, DJ Necroman, Meme Queen, Jay Marshall, Joe Face, El Jazguar, Sweetie Petey in the Back CD, Declan J. Keen, Totally Not a Mimic, Josh Scharf, Vismark, Michael King, Noilez, Roland, Petrus Montanu, Q Chan, Jean Philippe Malouin, Nicholas Nelson, Steinul, Fazy, Vivitis, Ross Armstrong, Byron Callan, Callum May, Grimbeard and Nerrell are my two dads, Rourke McKenzie, Austin Scott, Keith Pitt, Brianna Maria McKenzie, Lucas Kettner, Nikita Denisov, Mr. Sark, Dylan Sorum, Daniel Person, Brendan Naftel, Jojo Evans, Colton Rowe, PJ, League of Struggle, Zubertuber, Sebastian Wappler, Sean Clausen, Omar Yid, Calavera, Bindle, Chris Jordan, Tomas Pelikan. Yeah, this looks like a check name. I'm gonna try my best. Zdenek Benes, Our Attack, Bubblegum Kirapop, 
Dr. Commissar, Colin Boyd, Trenton Wilkins, Big Cheese 1000, Justin Stewart, David Offord, Scoss 117, D, Brett Weaver, Nuan Sonar, Mystical Lint, AJ, James Young, Mangy Mongrel, Tyler Long, Crispy, Adam Page, AI, Mike Garza, Jack L. Winsky, Khalil Corey, Dilda, Spicy Milkan, David Moreau, Sir Aloha Mora, Eris Alessandrakis, Pedro Costum, Adventure Game Geek, Ghost LPs, Niles Crane 19, Johan Kvand, Adrian Fachi, Christopher White Schneider, Ricky Goss, Pixelfish, Wednesday V, Alex Hanna, Professor Nex, Lucas, Castiel, Alex Blackwood, No Bunny, The Gaming Beehive, Little Bee, Drunk Taco, Matthias Waltman, Ricky Rigatoni, Robert McMahon, Hashi Singh, Jared, AJ Leroy, Brad, Anthony Daniel, Jonathan Becker, Sam C, Warhopper, Kevin Thurber, G Pete, The Super Pickle, Surprise, The Voyant Claire, Gargantua, Joe Reynolds, Ignacio de Guglielmi, Melon Man, Level Zero, Sven Grell, Grim beard but with bananas taped to his hands. Oh no. Okay Cat Dad, Tess Dunn, Yoni Niamela, Homeboy Dirtbag, Crampig Newt, Babyhead, Tiana Lazik, Big Dong Daddy Dom, Razzle Dazzle B13, Uncle Dozer TV, Diggity D7187, Kanem, Wabuktis, Slavic Dreams, Phony Soprano, Yef, Steven Francisco Santana, The Becker Sattler Clan, Oh fuck, <laughs> Pyotr Zamkowski. <laughs> let, let me know how that was. Nameless, Alexis Pinsenalt, Jacek Kotarba, Visitor Information, Nichols Monroe, Gato Malo, Tony Gleed, Lefazar, Bones Malones, Duke Lorderon, Zan, Eric Leong, Vukrules, Nagru, Daniel Newberry, Matt Chester, Sweeneasy, Fitzgerald93, Bimbizzle, Viet Do, Pentagon Black, Dust Sucker, Michael Sapka, Conrad Eastman, Oliver Marshall, Luke Gasway, Furin, Pagan Butler, Kuhn, Ikifu, Brandon Shock, Sam Fuller, Cloister56, Yasarian, Allegory, Lucas Mendel, Stray Dog Freedom, Similar Dude, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Rasmus Karras, Aubrey, Devaith Faust, Silvano Gonzalez, Ian, Huai Li, Michael B, Mr. Roboto, John Adams, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Ian Baranek, Florian Bogle, Bertie Bertig, Rachel Rose, Vinculus, Avalanche Reviews, Negative Creep, Alex Theodoroff, Chris Barb, Sean Lovett, Haimo Statman, Boyi, Oriol, HL Longboy, Manu Weidman, Danny D, Tony Brandt, Joshua Stewart, Curano, Chef Toker, QL2040, Gideon Joubert, Scott Motus, This It Four, Cabbage, Frand, Austin Mathis, Faye, Peachy Pixel 8, Sir Tristan, Schluff, Sarah Denman, Stanislav, Casey Gould, Krylar, Ross Carmona, Kalifas, Sammy 3D, Mikey Tambourine, Schwabalaba, <laughs> Monolith, Moral, Daniel Gen, Sean Bradford, Demar, Unpolished Mirror, John Stone, Frantic Atlantic, Jick Magger, Hamish Batten, Mara Alina, Jacob Hanley, Octo, Raul Vidal, Josh Hessler, Adam Wheeler, Can, Pommy, Nylanthrope, Emil Johansson, Alex Yu, Prod Mage, Van the Cheesen, Nick Johnson, Franz, Solkrat, Iota Ken Cree, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, G'day, Buckaroo, Who Done It, Bertigan, Dante K3, Frank, Eric Lawn, and Yui. Thanks for being a patron. Uh, it, cer it certainly means a lot, uh, more and more every day. Um, I, I am more and more thankful that you're here. With every day, we, we, we inch further into, into madness. Um, I hope you're doing all right. Hope my video could uh, distract you for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see you real soon. Uh, stay goth, stay gaming. Productions.